Rachel Preston Prince for her talk, uh, Kuawa in Context, the Architecture of John Gaumim in New Mexico. Rachel is um, an architectural historian, an educator based in Santa Fe. She's also a research for the Santa Fe style. Uh, she's documented more than 600 historic buildings across New Mexico and produced two uh, documentaries about the architecture of Acoma and uh, Bandelier. Um, she regularly writes, uh, teaches, speaks, makes films, <laughs> makes me tired, <laughs> and uh, speaks about New Mexico's regional architecture and New Mexico's thousand year tradition of sustainable design. And I'm really interested in hearing about that because that's a long time. <laughs> so uh, she'll discuss Meme's work and also his influence in New Mexico. And I'm gonna add Colorado because of that um, fine arts building, including the design of our very own visitor center well, thanks so much for having me today. I'm um, really honored to be here. Um, so, a little bit about a little bit more about me. I'm uh, I'm trained as a historic architect, um, but I have macular degeneration, so I'm going blind in my center vision, and I can't really draw or climb under buildings anymore. So, um, I decided that I wanted to pivot and uh, become an architectural storyteller, so that I could help historic places to. Um, sort of suss out the most interesting, often forgotten parts of their story so that they can use that to storytell, build content, and reach a new audience. Specifically with the idea of sort of bending over, uh, bending towards tour tourism a little bit so that we can um, bring in new people who want to come to the state and may not realize sort of the treasures that we have. So um, I think I found the beginnings of an interesting story about Koala and the um, Visitor Center, some of which you will know. Um, and, but I tried to do a little bit of summaries um, for people who don't have a real grasp of all of this. So uh, forgive me if it feels a little bit like we're drinking from a fire hose. Hopefully it'll be uh, not too uh, much information. So um, I come into Beam's work later in his life um, because Despite the fact that I have never been interested in mid-century modern art and architecture, um, I worked on two projects um, that of memes um, where Alexander Girard was working for him and um, doing interiors. And one was um, at the Museum of International Folk Art. You can see memes drawing on the top left um, and Girard's interior for a new section of the building that was designed by one of his partners, actually, uh, one of Gerard's partners, um, for his collection, which he donated to the museum. And then also for the Peterson Student Center at St. John's College, which was a sort of a pet project of memes in his later years. And he brought on Gerard because he wanted to have these like brightly colored pops of color in these basically white buildings. Which I thought was really interesting because I never really realized that meme was a fan of color or modern anything. Um, so that was really kind of cool. I also get to spend a lot of time with um, Barbara Felix, who's an architect here in Santa Fe. She does historic preservation. Um, and she also did the Acoma Visitor Center. And that's in my movie. That's how I met her. And um, she was doing a restoration of La Fonda several years ago. And I got to sort of shadow her as she was going through that process. And so I also learned about meme from that point of view, but it wasn't that we were actually working on meme stuff or trying to preserve it. It was just something that sort of happened in my sidelines um, because I've mainly been working in Pueblo and architecture for the past little bit. So um, I was always on the fringe, but I was never really in memes work. Um, so when I got, but recently, I've actually got several meme projects, and um, and so I've decided to go to the Center for Southwest Research, and then Barb called me about this lecture, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm learning so much about this guy. I'd really love to share these stories. So it's not something that is uh, uh, natural for me yet. So you'll see that I uh, check my notes every once in a while because I want to make sure I'm trying to give you guys good information. Let's talk about how we get how meme comes into the picture at uh, Coronado. So the everybody 
came into the picture at Coronado because of one man, and that is Edgar Hewitt. And whenever I read anything about Edgar Hewitt, this is the guy I think of. I don't know if y'all know who that is. It's supposed to be the most interesting man in the world. Um, but um, he, I, I, I mean, I just think he's, he sounds like this incredible guy. So I'm going to just list off some of his accomplishments. So he got his PhD from the University of Virginia in Switzerland. I mean, University of Geneva in Switzerland. Um, to get it, he visited excavations in Italy, Greece, Palestine, Egypt, Central America, and Mexico. Then he went on to lead exhibition, exhibi expeditions at Puyé, Mesa Verde, Bandelier, Hemes, Chaco, Carigua, and Guatemala, Karai. He went to the Yale Babylonian expedition to Palestine, Syria, Arabia, Mesopotamia. Then he went to Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Sahara, Asia Minor, Doga, Deccan Iowa Islands. Then he came back to Kuala and Parai. And then he went to the UK and Scandinavia. I mean, this guy was incredibly, incredibly um, well-traveled. He had seen um, excavations all around the world. He wrote the 1906 Antiquities Act, which protects all of historic buildings. Um, he helped to obtain uh, Ecos Pueblo, Carai, Qua, uh, Gran Quivera, and Abo for historic sites. He helped to find Santa Fe style and to find an entirely new uh, economy that was based on tourism for Santa Fe. He drafted our laws for historic preservation. He was president of the New Mexico Normals College, which we know now as Highlands. Um, he also was director of the School of American Ar Archaeology, which is now SAR, the Museum of New Mexico, the American Research Arm of the Archaeological Institute, and the San Diego Museum. He also started El Palacio and Arts and Antiquities magazines. And interestingly for me, as someone who works on Santa Fe style, he moved um, his school of SAA and the museum into the Palace of the Governors because he was concerned that if, if it wasn't being used, that they were going to let it fall into ruin. And I just think that's really interesting. Anyway, he had to be one of the most interesting world at the time, but in reality, he was this guy. He lived in Colorado and was a teacher, and his first wife, Cora, ended up getting TB. She would end up having to come to New Mexico to convalesce um, and, and during the summers in New Mexico. She would only end up living a few years. However, when they were, she was convalescing, Hewitt was meeting all these people who were also convalescing for TB and also H1N1 um, or the Spanish flu. That would end up impacting his entire life, including uh, Kenneth Chapman, who he ended up hiring to run uh, or to be the secretary for SAR in the Museum of New Mexico. Uh, painters Carlos Vieira and Gerald Cassidy, who he would end up using in 1915 for the Panama, California exhibition. And also uh, uh, Cassidy, or, or, yeah, Cassidy for the Museum of New Mexico. He ended up meeting Sheldon Parsons, who he would end up making the director of the museum. And Don Gami who um, ended up, he ended up starting to work with in 1921 and then would work for decades um, together um, with me. He said, <clears throat> interestingly to me, uh, Hewitt said at the time that the artists who are painting here are just as truly researchers as are the scientists. They're seeking new truths, experimenting in human expression, offering new opinions, testing new evidences and recording cultural advancement. So Hewitt had this incredible personality, like he was very larger than life. And um, and they called him El Toro the <laughs> Bull. Um, but he had he was very ambitious and he wanted to create a, a big monuments that drew big crowds. We're gonna get into a couple of the ones that preceded this in here, here in a sec. But he decided that Coronado Guala was the perfect marriage of Pueblo, Hispano, and American history. The American history part being sort of the archaeological aspect of it. And the study of it. Um, he decided to make it the first archaeological theme park open to the public and he was going to go big. His original concept for the monument, I wish I had pictures of this, I have not found pictures of this, Only I've only read about it, um, but his original concept for the monument included a large museum with a bridge across the river that was surrounded by, or surmounted by a 40-foot equestrian statue of the conquistador that was facing east. Visitors would climb a staircase to an observation deck at the base where they would look out over the Pueblo. 
a smaller statue of Coronado was going to be placed in the southern uh, plaza with the kivas. Um, and uh, the sculptor was going to be Eugenie Chonard, who was uh, a contemporary of memes and a favorite of memes. It was, she, he considered her one of the best sculptors in the United States. But none of that was going to come to be because obviously it was the Great Depression. And cutting the price of a couple sculptures wasn't going to get Hewitt his tourist attraction. So he adapted and landed on the idea of a simpler building and less reconstruction on the ruin. So the uh, Coronado Quattro Centennial Commission and UNM applied for um, staffing from the WPA, from the FARA, Federal Emergency uh, Reconstruction, I think, Administration, or and the uh, National Youth Association programs to finish the monument and the visitor center and the landscaping. And then they collaborated with the Museum of New Mexico and SAR for uh, trucks and gear um, so that they can make sure things got done. Um, this is a picture of uh, New Deal workers um, uh, at Coronado and at, right after it was built. And I, the reason the sculpture doesn't really, is that the sculpture he had it planned, I don't think, but it's the same, it, it's the same perspective. So they, he anticipated a four story whole horse sculpture. And I just can't even imagine what it would be like to stand next to that, um, like those guys are right there. Anyway, so he had a job to do and he wanted to send, um, stuff 10 pounds of building into a five pound bag. And in order to do that, he called his friend, John Gamin. John Gamin was widely considered the, uh, the father of Pueblo revival style architecture and more generally what people think of when they think of a Southwest architecture. I love these two photos of him when he was young and he was just getting his legs under him on the left and, and on the right when he was a master and you can see that he's really learned to listen. And that's what he actually becomes known for. His start in architecture was extraordinary. So John Gamin IV was a military man and all of his predecessors were um, engineers and his grandfather was actually also an architect. Um, excuse me. Um, they all graduated from VMI. His father was an engineer, but he was also a priest, an Episcopal priest. He was stationed in Brazil and he designed his own church there. And Don grew up speaking fluent Portuguese, even more so than English, but he also spoke German. He returned to the um, States when he was 16 years old and he went to VMI and he graduated from there in 1914 with a degree in engineering. In World War I, he served in the army. He was a uh, com commander of a battalion of soldiers in Iowa. Um, they were training recruits to um, send over. And then he served as, because of his uh, lung situation, he served as a guardsman in New York where he actually got uh, H1N1, Spanish flu. Um, and that made his lungs so bad that he was gonna be susceptible to breathing ailments for the rest of his life. And we're gonna get a little bit into what that was um, about here in a little while. Um, he ended up going to New York City for treatment and his doctor recommended that he convalesce at a sanatorium. He recommended Saranac in the Adirondacks, Asheville in the Smoky Mountains, and uh, the high desert of the Rockies. Bean leaves the doctor's office and he's walking down the street and he passes by the office of the ATSF uh, railroad and he sees flyers in the window. And he decides almost immediately that this is what he's going to do. He's going to come to New Mexico. And I'm not sure if these are the ones he saw, but I was kind of curious what those flyers might have looked like, what might have called him out um, to here. And these are two of the um, ones that were from that time period. It may, it may not have been the ones he saw, but I, I definitely uh, can see where he, I would want to get out of pandemic jail and go exploring. Um, after seeing those, it made me definitely want to get out. So anyway, in 1920, Meme arrives in Santa Fe at Sunmount, and he's um, been prescribed rest and relaxation. So um, if you didn't know, H1N1 and TB um, were uh, kind of like what you would think of as full-blown AIDS or maybe an untreatable cancer um, now. It just isn't really a treatment. There weren't, uh, the antibiotics weren't developed into the 40s. Um, and the only really hope that you had was um, rest, usually at a high altitude and in fresh air, and the hope that your body would overcome the disease. So um, some, some of the people described the experience as taking a long horizontal view of the world. 
Um, so me, meme lands at Sun Mount, which is one of Isaac Rapp's buildings in Santa Fe. So I'm going to go back in time for just a second. So if meme is the father of um, what we think of as Southwest architecture, uh, Isaac Rapp is actually the grandfather. Um, he, he literally designed Spanish Pueblo revival into existence. Um, we will find that meme and rap try to save the same problem, solve the same problems on the same building, sometimes in different times. Um, and just to look at just a tiny bit of, um, uh, rap's work moving from the left, uh, top down. He did the territorial capital, territorial, uh, governor's mansion. The one below that, um, is the gross Kelly warehouse and, uh, over at the rail yards in Santa Fe. Um, the one on the top right is the uh, Colorado Supply Company warehouse in Morley, Colorado. Um, and the one below that is where things really start to get interesting for us because that is the 1915 Panama, California exhibition, New York, New Mexico building, which was the precursor to the Museum of New Mexico, which is right below it, which was the 1917 building. So three buildings on the right that RAP did are all the same building just tweaked differently and they're all interestingly all those three and the one on the bottom are all based on uh san Esteban mission at acoma um it's actually once you get to the museum of new mexico it really starts to look like um san Esteban. um but what's really interesting in this case here is that those bottom two buildings the 1915 Panama, california exhibition uh building and the museum of new mexico were both commissioned by hewitt this is where he starts to develop this idea of creating this monumental architecture um, and he's going to end up doing it at a different scale at uh, Coronado. So Meme even said, <clears throat> excuse me, that he became a regional architect and began for, to look for new precedents in Santa Fe. He said, the newly constructed Museum of New Mexico built in 1917 in the Spanish Pueblo style and in permanent materials, which was very interesting to him, um, inspired him greatly. Then we'd go on to do renovations at uh, Sun Mount um, and at the Museum of New Mexico, which are both um, wrap buildings. The top building on the left is wrapped uh, La Fonda and um, here on the corner in Santa Fe, catty corner to the Museum of New Mexico. And Mean was actually hired to do a six story addition, not even a decade after um, Lafond the first La Fonda was built um, because the Harvey company was being so wildly um, they, it was adored. People were coming here. So many they couldn't even, they didn't have any places to put. Really and truly, it's not just meme, it's also meme and rap. They're the grandfather and the father of what we consider uh, New Mexico style, South, Southwest style architecture. Rap is more Spanish Pueblo revival. Meme ends up being more Pueblo revival. Um, and that's kind of another lecture. <laughs> So anyway, we're going to go back to Sun Mount. Sorry. So he's gone back. He's good. He's here in 1920. And part of his R&R &R at Sun Mount is to get eight hours of uh, exercise and outside time every day. So um, people would walk up to Sun Mountain. Sun Mount is right at the base of Sun Mountain. And they would also over, walk over to Moon Mountain, which is the sort of the sister mountain here in Santa Fe. And then they would walk down Telegraph Road, which we know now as Camino del Monte. So the way to Sun Mount. And um, he would walk right past this building. Now, this is a house that Jesse Nussbaum um, photographed in 1912. I'm going to show you another house he photographed in 1912. Um, this is the Roque Lobato house, um, which is a caddy corner, uh, actually sort of right across the street from the Scottish Rite Temple. It's sort of enwrapped in uh, gates right now, so you can't really see it. Um, but um, Newsbaum went through all of Santa Fe and took literally a thousand photographs of every building almost in Santa Fe for an exhibition called the New Old Exhibition at the House of the Governors in 1912. And that was the first attempt to solidify Santa Fe style architecture. I think that it's very likely that these two buildings and their many subsequent copies, including the Palace of the Governors, which was based on this design, um, we may find out that this is where the inspiration for the visitor center came from. I think you can see the, the uh, sort of symmetry um, around the portal.
but it's, I mean, it's like a classic Santa Fe style building uh, once they impose Beaux-Arts order on it. And we'll talk about that here in a second too. So um, the people are interesting also at Sunmouth, um, including the director, Frankie Mara, whose brother, Harry, was the, your, some of y'all may know, was the Sherd curator for the Laboratory of Anthropology. He created the Mara Collection. Um, and Harry and his wife designed the state flag, the, the yellow background with the Zia, um, and were co-investors in Sunmail. And Frank was very intentional in imparting to his parent, um, patients the, his shared interest in these um, traditions, art, and culture, and architecture. So in 1919, the, uh, 1919, the year before Meme gets here, Meme's friend, Mary Conkley, who also was at Sunmail, um, gathered with two of her friends from Denver, Ann Evans and Mary Williard, and the architect Boy Burnham Hoyt, who was also down here for convalescent stuff, um, along with uh, Frankie Mara, Edgar Hewitt, and Carlos Vieira, who um, ends up becoming a photographer. We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, and they start the Committee for the Preservation and Restoration of New Mexico Mission Churches. Um, so that's in 1919. Meme gets here in 1920, and in during Lent in 1921, Mary Evans and um, and a businessman from Santa Fe named Daniel Kelly, who owned the Gross Kelly Warehouse that Rap did, um, just as an aside, uh, went to go visit the church in Trumpas. And when Meme saw it, he his decision was made; he couldn't take it, and he decided that he was going to become specialized in that kind of architecture. So Burnham Hoyt, who is the friend from Denver, the architect friend from Denver, is assigned as the head of the restoration of Trumpus, and Meme is assigned as his assistant. And what's interesting at this time is Meme is not an architect, right? He has no training in architecture. He's has some training in engineering, so he knows how to do the math part, but he doesn't really have any training at all in architecture. So he was really curious and had a lot of time on his hands. So all of his friends that were from the society and also from Sunmount were saying, you've got to go study in Denver. You have this amazing opportunity. Um, Burnham Hoyt, the architect, runs the Atelier Denver, which is a Beaux-Arts architecture school and can help you find a job and you'll be done in four years. And, and like, this is what you're meant to do. So he did. And so he leaves and uh, gets a job with a firm in Denver named Fisher and Fisher and starts going to the Atelier. And he's an award-winning young designer. I mean, he's the top of his craft. He's really good. He's got a natural knack for it. Only he gets sick again. So he has to come back to Sun Mount in, in 1924. And that's when things really start to get lucky for us. So um, he immediately joins in with the efforts of the Mission Church Group, um, and he sets about to learn everything he can about our styles of architecture. So, uh, and they get to work on um, working from top left to bottom right. So uh, Laguna, Zia, Acoma, San Esteban, um, Santa Ana, uh, they purchase Chimayo to try to save it. Um, they do a restoration on Trumpas. They design, Santa Maria Mission at McCarty's. Uh, they redesigned Santa Tomas Church at Abiquiu, which I didn't realize was a new building. Um, and then they designed Cristo Rey in Santa Fe so that they have a place to put the Lacus Drents Reredos, which were originally on the chapel on the plaza, which Ganga Meme ended up doing the building for that replaced all of that. So meanwhile, um, while he's been working on the churches, Meme is also building a relationship with Carlos Vieira, who was, we talked about earlier, a painter. But he ends up becoming a photographer here, and he offers Meme a six-volume set of photographs that literally documents the entire state. Um, and what's really interesting about this is because from mission searches to corbel details, he basically has created Meme a pattern book, a pictionary of architectural details, if you will. And I am willing to, I'm willing to bet that if we were to go through those pattern books, that, that those photo books, we might be able to find the corbels that inspired um, the corbels at the visitor center because Meme, he borrows from that all the time. It becomes a real treasure 
um, and all of these pattern books. Um, it's the same sort of way that the, the pattern books were made around the pottery, which we may not would do that now, but back in the day, it was uh, sort of considered to be honorable um, the way they thought about it. So anyway, um, Meme teams up with Cassius McCormick, who is an architect who's also convalescing at Sunmount, and they get to work. Um, they do residences and government projects. They do tons of additions. Uh, they do some churches. Um, the mission church, uh, the mission project leads to a five-year project at Acoma San Esteban in the top left, um, which gets under his skin, Meme's skin, the same way it did Raps, right? So Rap copied the building four times. Meme ends up doing the same thing. Um, he creates it in his own way at, at School Hall at UNM and at St. Mary's um, in, at McCarty's. And he finds his rhythm in Santa Fe. Um, while he had a really thick accent for a while and his personality and small stature, it kind of made him really the butt of hazing um, at BMI. And, but I should say but, um, but the people in the Southwest thought he was super charming and it ends up serving him really well because people go, people will hire him to do a house and then they'll hire him to do hit their office and his, and, every, and everything else they're doing. Their event center, um, Poblanos, for instance, was the Sims family, the same um, family hired him to work on the Sims building. So um, he was, he was very well liked. Um, he, uh, and so, uh, in these early years, he's um, establishing, he's helping to establish the old Santa Fe Association. Um, he adds to Holy Faith Episcopal here in Santa Fe. And then he goes on to design a bunch of really interesting stuff, including the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center, Fuller Lodge, uh, First Pres in Santa Fe, um, the Cathedral of St. John in um, Albuquerque, um, parts of Highlands University, um, parts of UMNM, uh, the core of UMNM. Uh, Los Poblanos, the Museum of Inter International Folk Art, which we saw earlier. Um, he does a major structural repair of St. Um, Francis Cathedral. I didn't realize that in the 20s, they took out the floor of St. Francis Cathedral to try to stabilize all, stabilize all the columns. Um, and then he went to competition to redesign the plaza um, at Santa Fe, which doesn't get implemented for many years, but this competition was a really big deal. Anyway, um, eventually Meme is actually elected to the American Institute of Architects by vote, um, which is a huge honor. And I don't know if that would ever happen today. Um, so um, in the depression years, when a lot of people were really struggling, a lot of artists and architects were really struggling, Meme actually hits a stride and he's kept busy with major New Deal projects. Um, he was named the head of the Historic American Building Survey in 1933. He did Schools Hall at UNM, as we talked about a second ago, Zimmerman Library, uh, Santa Fe Municipal Building, which is now our library, um, and then the uh, uh, Public Welfare Building, which we call the Villagra Building now. Um, he did the Santa Fe County Courthouse, and just a quick plug, that has been fully restored now, and they've actually even restored the courtyard. So if you come to Santa Fe, you might want to come look at it. It's really very special. Um, they did a great job. Um, and the Laboratory of Anthropology Directors Resident and its directors residence, and then of course, you get to the visitor center. So uh, the story of what I learned about the visitor center is really intriguing. Uh, to begin with it, the project um, was a little bit of a hot mess, to be honest. Usually we have lots of time, like a, at least a year, to design a public building that's going to be a monumental type building. Um, but it seems really that Meme had days and massive budgetary constraints. And I think it's very probable that they were working on multiple ideas, multiple plans at the same time. Um, just based on some of the dates of the drawings, it just doesn't make sense. They're they're going back and forth between ideas. We're about to see that. Um, but I was super thrilled to get to go to the Center for Southwest Research a few weeks ago and get to touch all those original drawings. I was kind of blimped by it. It was so amazing um, because many of them were actually drawn by him. Um, I felt like I was reaching back in time. So, um, but I just want to acknowledge before we start looking at these drawings that this is a little bit of a can of worms um, because uh, there are clues in the drawings, but we don't actually know what archives this answer is located in yet. And this building hasn't really been studied that much. So it's just the beginning of a story that we'll probably um, 
we're learning about the visitor center as we get into this. So let's look at these drawings. The story goes that on October 16, 1939, Mean visits Kuala with Reginald Fisher, who is at that point the deputy director of the Museum of New Mexico. By the end of the day, they determined that the center would be located in the southwest corner of the Pueblo, east of the exterior walls. It would be in the shape of a U with legs facing, um, so the patio was facing the river and the east. Um, they thought that it would have custodians quarters on the north, um, what I would call a keeper's house, a central lounge, and a museum on the south. The building would be adobe and very native in character. Um, Meme charged Coronado, but he uh, charged churches, so his plans and specs cost $600, which is a very good deal. Um, so anyway, we're, the, the picture we're looking at right now is a very early version, um, one of the earliest concepts. And we know it's early, um, even though it's, it doesn't have a date on it, because his drawings did not have the gang windows on these side elevations. They had individual windows. And note here that he is showing us a parallel relationship between the front wall of the Pueblo and the back wall of the building. So he's anticipating that there is space between them and also that um, they uh, are parallel, right? So that's what we're seeing. So um, that was his intent. And as we all know, this is what got built. Um, it's a little different than we expect. Um, it is uh, right up on the Pueblo. Now we know it's in the Pueblo. Um, uh, it's, a, it's slightly off parallel off these walls back here. Um, and there is there's no superintendent's house in the sketch either. And we're about to see more. So jumping back into drawings. <clears throat> now, this is probably the first concept sketch. There are sculptures in the center and on the ends of the portal, um, one for Coronado, a priest, and an Indian. And notice that there is no back building, it's only a portal. Um, a set of uh, Coronado murals um, was supposed to be painted by Gerald Cassidy. Now, remember, he had painted for Hewitt at both the Museum of New Mexico and its precursor at the Panama, California exhibition. And it's really probable that he had actually painted these murals already and that they were going to recycle them. I don't know that for a fact, but that they did that a lot. So it wouldn't surprise me if we found that out eventually. Um, notice that the keeper's house is integrated on the north, the right. Um, and then there are individual windows on the north and south elevations. And Meme is noting native flora here out in front of the portal. This is a simplified version of that, um, what I call the fancy monument. <laughs> but um, instead, instead now of having a sculpture at the center and on the ends, we have an inscribed tablet between the murals and boncos at each end. Gail Stevens gave me some information on this. It was really cool. Um, the other day, she told me that this was Hewitt's doing. Um, because in December 1939, he decided that it was going to be too expensive. Now, remember, they're opening in May 1940, so he's got six months to get all this done. So he decides he's, he can't afford any of the sculptures. So he wants to use a stone tablet depicting a Pueblo Indian, a conquistador, and a priest that would be placed inside the museum. So this goes to illustrate one of the interesting points that I never realized about the final design. And that is that the very first day when Fisher and Meme were designing the building on site in one day, they wanted the east wall of the portal facing the Sandias to be made of glass. They actually said that. So this marks a major shift in the concept to um, also take out the keeper's house and add a museum on the north. And this appears to be really close to where they landed on the final design. If you're curious um, uh, what it might look like, um, what it might have looked like from that first um, concept, um, we can sort of reverse engineer. This is the portal at uh, El Delirio at the School for Advanced Research. The top one, um, photo is from the portal that um, William Penhallow Henderson designed um, for that. And he was a contemporary of themes, and then they filled it in several years later. So I imagine. But these pictures on the bottom are what it might have looked like um, before they decided to go with the more sophisticated um, fridge door concept. But at some point they decided that um, they needed more space and the idea of a Western room started to form. 
Um, this was the concept for the original exterior after the keeper's house was removed um, and after they started uh, adding the Western Museum. And you could tell because they're equal on either side. And in this back corner, which is closest to the parking lot, um, that was actually originally intended to be the main entrance of the uh, visitor center. And you would walk through and get to the lounge, the portal, and that was gonna be your reward for getting through um, to the, um, through the museum. Um, so I just think it's so amazing to imagine that the portal, which I have never not known as the primary entrance, was actually supposed to not be the primary entrance at all. So um, remember I said that we, they were talking about two, two buildings at the same time. So now we start to see this new um, concept happening where they know they need a second, um, uh, they, they need this Western uh, museum space in order to fulfill the program. But, and they're also talking about an archeology span section now. Um, but in this one, you see that they've now moved the wall back from away from the portal. And the portal is a lot less deep, and, but they have now taken out the entrance on the Southwest. I'm gonna drink a little water. Um, so this, day, this one is also non-dated. So it's really tricky to tell what the order of some of these drawings was. <clears throat> but if you take that sketch concept and then um, add the uh, entrance back again, so this was another set of drawings that's contemporary with others, um, there's the entrance, the office, the museum here, Coronado room in the center, an archaeology room on the right. So this is like a fusion between those two ideas, but it's still got that back entrance on the back. So, but I just wanted to um, really quickly talk about uh, the Beaux Arts training uh, as it's showing up in Means Building here because, you know, I never really thought of uh, Coronado as being sort of a, a high style building. Um, but really there are uh, Beaux Arts elements and it's same with the Palace of the Governors. So uh, for those that don't know, Beaux Arts uh, is a subset of Greek Revival or neoclassical architecture, uh, roughly 1885 to 1925 in the United States. Um, it's usually pretty over the top. It's like wedding cake architecture, um, a lot of people say, but it has um, order, symmetry, very formal design, um, it, grandiosity, a little bit of oversizing, and usually pretty elaborate ornamentation. So this is a New Mexican budget WPA version of it. Um, so the, the order is the regular spacing of the columns and the windows and the window jams and the mullions and the windows. The way that the ceilings are done, the symmetry on the um, either side of the portal, and the grandiosity is for the oversized portal, and the elaborate ornamentation comes in with all of the beautiful details with details that um, mean integrated into the building. Um, but this also isn't when it gets built. <laughs> Um, these are the revised elevation for the new merge concept. So now we've lost the entry portal. We've gained the windows um, on the sides. And um, I think these, this is just a sweet little hand-drawn elevation. It's so elegant. Um, but we can see here that uh, Meme is also using a stone base here um, at the bottom of the exterior stucco. Most Often um, we do this because uh, the Terrace Pueblos have this. Um, usually it's the entire first floor um, with stucco above uh, or adobe above. Um, but it's also a way of uh, protecting the bottom of the wall from canal lake splashback as well as uh, rising damp. So uh, when we have long periods of snow, the, we, there's actually a capillary action that pulls water up into the building and the stone helps prevent that. Here's a, another interpretation of that. Um, so it's starting to, they're starting to think about construction. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention that he's uh, integrated the canales into the Foviga ends, which is so beautiful. Um, unfortunately, it's very, very difficult to waterproof. And we also get kind of too big of flash floods for that. Um, so it usually overwhelms the outlet. Those don't last very long. Uh, you were asking me if, you, if we should preserve those now, I'd say add better canales, but keep them for aesthetics. Um, the portal has the, uh, these huge French doors integrated um, with matching transoms in them now, um, and windows that almost appear to be French doors, but aren't. Um, I think this would have ended up looking a lot like uh, the portal of Los Poblanos. Um, there's also a painted dado. 
uh, between the windows and likely around the sides of the portal that uses the stepped cloud symbol for the prayer for rain. And uh, I just wanted to note that the rand the vicas on the back side were originally supposed to be random. And uh, what we see now is regular. I'm not really sure when that happened. Um, I tried to call the architect of the renovation and um, he wasn't able to get back with me. So, um, but that isn't what got built. So if we go back real quick, see these walls are almost to the back of the uh, Coronado room. So what gets built though, I think, I'm 99% sure, is the first, well, actually the second portal concept. So I think what happened is that they ended up building just the portal with the side wings. And that's where they were thinking that they were gonna have to go. And you can kind of tell this because the back wall of the side wings and therefore what would be the portal kind of lines up with this side um, ruin, um, it, it's sort of parallel and right up against it. So what I think happens is we go if we go back to this, I think this is what gets built but with the modified entrance, um, the main entrance being the portal. And I think that during construction, they realized they had one opportunity to get enough building for the entire museum program. And so they decided to go for it. Um, I think that's why the Western Gallery ends up being inside the archaeological site. I don't think it was intended to be originally, um, but I do think the superintendent's quarters were intended to be. Um, and I, I swear that at one point I saw a picture of the building where a plane was flying sort of right alongside the face of it, and it was right after it got built. And I think I saw those um, French doors, but I have not been able to find that picture in any archive. If any of you have it, please let me know. Um, but what I think happened was that they built it with the um, French doors, and then almost immediately after, they came in and they they changed the doors, moved those to the back wall and the side wall of the new room, and then closed this in. And the reason why I say that is because we have 1940s era pictures that have this, there is no, there are no doors in this wall. Um, anyway, so here's a 1950 shot of the Western side with the doors having, have already been moved. Um, and then we can zoom in on a little bit. This is so great. Um, I'm so thankful to Matt Barber for sending me um, some pictures from the archive that I was able to um, add. But here it's really interesting. You can start to see that there was a lot more texture on the building um, back in that day and also some more ladders. Um, I think that they did that to match the sort of ruined appearance of the uh, ancestral Pueblo. Um, coming back into the drawings for just a second. Um, uh, we can see what Meme intended here. There's no free hand-drawn, uh, free hand-drawn lines here, um, but uh, we can see the eastern, both the doors on the east wall and also the portal ceiling was Vigas and Latias originally, and we'll see here in a minute that the photos show that they are, uh, that was built that way. Um, the wavy plaster, I don't know when that was added. Um, hopefully we'll find out soon. Um, just a few more details and we'll um, wrap it up. But um, here we can see that uh, the center originally had a dirt insulated roof. Um, it's really funny. Back in the day, they didn't realize um, that to get a decent R value or insulating value for um, earth insulation, you have to have 24 inches of dirt, which is kind of funny because there are literally a pit house and a kiva right behind this building that had really thick dirt roofs and if they just they just weren't paying attention to that and it's really because archaeologists don't study building performance and in fact architects didn't either for a very long time not until the past couple 30 years or so really um but um it was really interesting i think i'm going to actually borrow this example um because my very first ted talk which was almost a decade ago was about how archaeology can teach us sustainable design and um this is a great example of how we actually we borrowed the ideas of it but we didn't actually borrow the methodology as much as uh the, the look and feel of it um but it, that would have actually been a really sustainable solution but ultimately they came in and replaced the roof we'll see a little bit more about that here in just a second um, but I just wanted to really uh, take just a couple seconds to look at um, these beautiful hand-drawn 
um, drawings that they did for the builders to show them how they wanted it built. I love the section of the spindle um, here and also the interlocking doors. Um, that's the, the door and the transom sort of locked. And that's really good for keeping the air contained in the building and minimizing air infiltration. And it's also really uh, good for security. You can't really break that door as easily. And then also just a few more of these details about how uh, it's elegant how he's integrated the security bar as uh, the security bars right into the window dam and um he was just incredible at custom design but unfortunately the problem with custom design and it, this was is a real problem for you and him because he never standardized any of these details including for you and him um which means that they are crazy expensive to try to replace or even maintain so oh, um, the building was uh, described in 1940 as splendid, but the uh, exhibits were considered mediocre um, by Eric. Uh, this was by Eric Reed, who was the leading archaeologist at the time. And he lamented the place by other museum and the Keeper's House within the context of the Pueblo. Um, he wasn't alone in his disappointment, and unfortunately, trouble was brewing. So the opening of the monument was going to launch uh, um, the Coronado Quatrocentennial, um, so a uh, year-long celebration of the 400th anniversary of uh, Coronado's exhibition, and that's why it got designed in a few months. They were trying to get it um, ready in time to launch those events. It was crazy to try it, but they got it mostly done. Um, the dedication was on May 29th, 1940. And the evening of the dedication was also the first of 30 pageants, which were scheduled across New Mexico, Texas, and Arizona. Um, it premiered at UNM Stadium, and the reenactment of the Coronado Entrada had 18 acts, each of which played a different place on his journey. It was played out by a cast of more than 20,000 players, and it had a 300-foot portable stage. Um, there were all these events planned around it, folk life festivals and parades and all that kind of stuff. But I just want to pop into one of these pictures here to talk about uh, how valuable photography can be. Um, this is a 1940s era picture. We can see here that the visitor center um, is, uh, that the archaeology room, as we know it now, or the, the mural room, is the, was the visitor center back there. You can also see in the ceiling that it didn't have the wavy ceiling, it had a traditional ceiling. And I think that if we look at this edge condition um, between the two different tones of stucco that we're going to, we would find that the uh, stucco might have been a little bit lighter back in the day. Anyway, um, unfortunately, neither the pageant or the folk festivals drew the expected crowds, and the impact was almost immediate. Two days after the center opened, they were given information, they were given instructions that there, no further funds would be made available, and they had to finish the project with what they had. Hewitt's dream was realized, and it's so cool that the site is the first archaeological site open to the public in the U.S. We're going to zoom out for just a minute, and um, and then we'll wrap this up. So, uh, talking about the context of Means work. So, um, while he's designing the visitor center, he's also the director of the Historic American Building Survey, which is documenting Ceremonial Cave, which we know as Al Alcove House at Bandelier. That was a PWA project, and it was instigated and originally excavated by Hewitt. He was, they were also documenting Ken Chilton at Chaco, which was a CCC project, also excavated by Hewitt. He was working on uh, Maisel's Indian Trading Post on Central in Albuquerque. Some of you may know the building. Um, sadly, during the pandemic, it closed permanently, but those murals on the outside are incredibly important and very underappreciated. Please drive by and see them. They're absolutely stunning. They're done by native artists um, in 1939. And he was designing uh, Cristo Rey, of which we talked about a little bit um, at first, but I love looking at these old historic postcards. He'll end up going and doing dozens of uh, buildings for the uh, for UNM, residences, First Prez in Taos, San Busco Center in Santa Fe, uh, but he did renovations for the Country Club in Albuquerque. He uh, added to the New Mexico School for the Deaf, which is also a wrap project. Um, he did a restoration of the Palace of the Governors, dozens of wonderful churches, um, and ends up going on to write the historic preservation ordinance for the city of Santa Fe in um, uh, 1957. 
And um, after pretty much after the second war, he ends up kind of becoming the guy at the top of his uh, of his firm and also the profession. So he's doing a lot more advising and sort of uh, uh, just consulting out of the kindness of his heart. And he's letting most of his younger um, associates do most of the designing, but it's always to his standard. So um, that's, uh, and he's, I mean, obviously left an incredible indelible mark in New Mexico. I wish I had time to show you some more of his buildings. They are so stunning. Anyway, so when I was preparing for this, um, I just want to talk just as, for three slides about the landscape real quick. Um, when I was preparing for this, I went to Google Earth and I just want to pass this on because I think there's a lot of people who are sort of hobby preservationists um, who may not know about Google Earth, but they've been flying since 1985. Um, Google has been flying satellites. And so we it's, it's very easy to put together a uh, recent historical history of buildings that you might be wanting to preserve. Um, and I wanted to show you just a couple examples of that. So when I uh, started studying for this talk, um, I, uh, I, I really loved how you could start to tell the relationship between the center and the site and the river. And um, we know, say, for instance, that before Cochiti Dam, the river was this wide. It was much wider. And we can start to see some of its flow patterns. Um, and we know that in the 1600s, that it was a quarter mile away. So it's actually just a recent story of what's happening with the river. Um, but the fun thing about zooming in on these um, satellite images is you can start to see um, some of the stuff that you can't see from the ground. Um, the the rooms of the room blocks, you can see some old trails. There's actually pit houses, I think, that you can see in here um, in some of this. And so if you're uh, a, if you're an archaeology nerd, this is a really fun, it's a really fun tool to see how things evolve. And one great example of how we can do that uh, at, here at the Visitor Center, top left is 2004, bottom right is 2005. So you can see that um, in 2004, it had a dark colored probably bituminous roof. And um, in 2005, they've now got a, a light colored roof. I don't think it's TPO, um, but they've also got a mechanical system. Uh, we all, I also saw that in 2009, the great, the big Kiva, uh, the painted Kiva was covered. So there must've been some kind of project on that at that time. But anyway, if you're ever trying to suss out details, recent building history details, that's a great, great tool to use. Um, and it's super fun for archeology span nerds. And I just wanted to uh, touch on one last uh, slide and talk about the unusual um, way that we approach the visitor center. Because um, it's kind of weird to come from the side at an angle. Um, but I, I just wanted to reiterate that like we were supposed to be walking along the edge of this ruin to the back left corner here. That was going to be the main entrance. And remember the portal was supposed to be the reward, um, but that portal was originally gonna face Hewitt's Bridge and the monument. And I just can't even imagine what it would be like to come up to the center now and have that 40 foot tall thing standing out there calling you like, this is the way to go. Um, but it's just really fascinating. It's a, a, a really interesting story. Like I said, it's just the beginning. Um, as more information is uncovered, there may be many, many more layers that we discover about this building. But that's what I've learned. Rachel, thank you so much. That was really interesting because I have nothing, I mean, I know nothing that much about archaeology or um, architecture, only that it's a piece of art. Uh, um, that's why I tried to put in a little bit about uh, sustainability um, because I wanted, I, I kind of wanted to share some of what we know with you guys. Yeah. Um, any any questions besides myself? Is there are, are there books written about him that list all the buildings that he did? Because when uh, Rachel was going through that list of all the different things he's done, I was just absolutely astounded. I've seen so many of them and didn't know they were memes. I love that you say that because I was totally shocked as well because there are all these buildings that I love. I love the Para building. I love the Santa Fe County Courthouse. And I had, and, oh, and I used to live in Knob Hill in Albuquerque. And I love the church, the yellow church in Knob Hill that he did. And I had no idea that all of these buildings that I loved were his. 
Yeah. Yes, there's lots of building. There's lots of books that write about him. But to be honest with you, I'm I'm working on meme on a couple other projects where I have to write the story for them, um, and their particular version of that story. And uh, it, there's not really one that ties it all together. There's just really not not in a way that's really coherent. That's why I started drawing a timeline. But I do think I'm going to put um, a timeline up on my website soon. Excellent. That Thank way we can just click on the picture and see where it is in time. Thank you. Sure. Rachel, aren't you preparing a new book, up, a new upcoming book? Mm -hmm. On me? I'm working on a book called The Spirit Seeker's Guide to New Mexico Architecture. And it's really, <laughs> it's really, uh, it's not just about Catholic and Christian uh, New Mexico spiritual architecture, but about our, we have an incredible tradition of all different kinds of architecture here. We have one of the only uh, Hindu temples in the, in the United States here. Um, and uh, the Sikhs here, the Sufis, um, all different kinds of groups. And uh, a lot of it, I'm actually probably going to have a whole chapter just on means churches. Um, there's about, I think there's something like 38 churches, but I'll be documenting those all this summer. Okay, well, let us know. Happy to share. Actually, um, at, on this page, if you're on Instagram or Facebook, um, my uh, call sign is at Arca Ministry. Um, and um, if you wanna follow along, you, I'm gonna be posting um, new tidbits about all of this. In fact, I'll probably break this, um, this top down into little bits. Um, and share even more information about it over time. Um, so just follow me at Arca Ministry and also uh, just a little, uh, I can help. I am gonna upload this, all of this talk and the slides and everything to Academia and I'll share them on my Facebook page, um, the Ministry of Architecture. So um, if you'd like to see more about it later or have the notes or whatever, I'm happy to share. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I understand there's a Frank Lloyd Wright building in Pecos, but I, I think don't, that's correct. I don't that, think that's you, correct. Yeah. Has anybody ever seen it? Not only, me. <laughs> only, only, from, only, from, only from the road and you can only see kind of the roof line uh, as you're going north into the Pecos wilderness. It's beyond the um, west side and it's setting kind of low. Interesting. Hmm. Um, here's a little secret. There's actually a Frank Lloyd Wright building in Santa Fe, um, but they took a Frank Lloyd Wright plan and then they tweaked it. Um, but it is, I mean, it is actually very much his plan, but they just made it to fit in here. Um, but I thought that was really interesting. I, I learned that just a few months ago. Wow, what building is it? It's a residence over on the east side. Hmm. I haven't gone over and snuck in to take pictures yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I would ever do that. <laughs> so I had a problem with a rap. Who is rap? Isaac Rap. Um, so he he was a really famous architect, the generation before memes. So, so he gets your spell that. Huh? R A P. R A P P, Isaac. R -A -P -P. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Isaac Rapp, and um, he he really started what we know of Southwest architecture, and meme was his was his antecedent, but the closest thing that we could get. I mean, these guys. I, I'm going to be honest. Like I was blown away. These guys are really really important architects, and I didn't even know it. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Rachel. Yes, sir. Fantastic presentation. I really appreciate it. One yeah. thing that, that I noted was in the early concept, the design uh, for the visitor center, the steps were to the courtyard and all the doors were then at courtyard level. Yes. Yes. And and then that one drawing that you showed where the, uh, um, the, the building um, uh, to to the west, uh, it shows the steps and so on and so forth. That's where I. That's my contribution. I designed the handicap ramp. Did you really? 
I was the university planner for UNM for 37 years and also the preservation officer. Oh, Joe. Well, as somebody who is going blind and has had, has a brand new hip and has had to use a lot of ramps lately, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> well, I, I started doing those in 1965 at UNM, and I worked with John on some of the buildings. Interesting sidebar, uh, I was meeting with him at his, at his house, and uh, he asked me, um, he said, what is, what is your, your favorite building that that um, my firm did on, on the campus because John did many, but he also supervised every one of them, including those that Brad Kidder did too. Um, and I said, well, Mesa Vista Hall. And he was so disappointed because I think he, I was going to mention probably Zimmerman Library or maybe the old student union building, which is anthropology or Skulls Hall, his first three major buildings. Mm -hmm. And I explained that, no, I was doing the space allocation and assigning space for departments. And I was in the process of moving the history department from Bandelier Hall, which he had designed, mm -hmm. um, over to Mesa Vista Hall. And I loved it because of the flexibility. It was just, it was very easy to work with. And then I turned the table and I said, well, John, what is your favorite building on the UNM campus? And he completely blew me away when he said, Johnson Gym. And the reason why he said it was the most difficult building that he ever had to design um, square footage wise in the uh, Spanish Pueblo vernacular, or Pueblo vernacular. And now the university, I, I retired in 2004. Uh, yet I'm not real pleased that's what's going on architecturally at the UNM. Uh, that's an understatement. But now you can see really almost nothing of that building. It's been done faces by by two other architectural firms with um with, with without being simpatico this is a big problem in my profession right now. <laughs> you know it's hard to bridge it's well, really hard have, to bridge we have some things in common i i have a i have a minor in architectural history from texas tech um, degree oh! from Degree in, degree in architecture and then minors and also in city planning, which is basically what I went into. Um, but um, also I have glaucoma and um, oh. I've, and I've had eight detached retinas. So, <gasps> oh so my gosh. Um, <laughs> we, we, um, we probably need to talk at some point in time about other than architecture. <laughs> yeah, but I would love to tap your mind about architecture at UNM. Most definitely. That would be... Yeah, I would love that, actually. I was thinking that myself. I was like, get a hold of Joe. <laughs> Barb's got all my got particulars. All his info. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, there's one last question, and it's mine. Okay. So you hear all the time Santa Fe style, ah, Pueblo revival style, and sometimes you hear Santa Fe Pueblo revival style. What's the difference? Okay, so nuts and bolts. I'm gonna have Joe back me up on this. I think he'll I think he'll approve. So uh Santa Fe, so and we're actually in the process here in Santa Fe of actually redefining all of that because currently everything is Santa Fe slash Spanish Pueblo revival style. So according to the state. Those styles are mashed together because they came from the same origin, right? Uh, anybody who's into art, um, architecture will know that the Renaissance and Baroque also had the same origin, but they're two different styles. So that's what we're trying to work on right now. So Santa Fe style is basically a mishmash of styles that you would have found if you arrived here in 1912 that so would have had any any material, any look might be formal, might be loose. There's no telling. So it's like when they got here and really started making it into a style, it's the Carlos Vera draw, uh, photographs, right? Or the um, Jesse Newsbaum photographs. That's going to be Santa Fe style. And that ends up culminating at the Palace of the Governors, right? Symmetry, same building as y'all's on a different scale, right? So that's Santa Fe style. And it can have any shape. It could be any size. 
Spanish Pueblo revival style was started by Isaac Rapp. And it is basically borrowing the terraces from the Pueblos and the mission front facades of the missions at the Pueblos and mashing those together into this new style that has lots of bumps on it, lots of layers, very elegant. And especially when you go inside, the Fonda is a great example, layers, 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 layers. As you're seeing through the building, there's all these beautiful portables and it, it sort of frames things. Pueblo revival style, John Gami, the, the son, he takes off all the mission facades. He's sort of interested in that for some of his churches, but for the most part, he's really taking the terracing of the Pueblos and the sort of, he's making it go more vertical. Um, but, for the, but it's much simpler in the way that he's doing it. And it doesn't have the mission facades. It's very elegant and his detailing is very elegant. Um, it's not quite so over the top. Um, that you might find in Spanish Pueblo Revival. And I think that the reason, a lot of the reason why he does that is because Spanish Pueblo Revival, these beautiful, you know, the stepped um, parapets, they're beautiful, they're stunning. And all of those layers, also stunning. It is so expensive to maintain all of those little chunks of roof and all of those little uh, steps in the stucco. But I think he's trying to streamline it in order to make it more buildable and more maintainable over time because he's very conscientious of that. So I think that's the difference. Spanish Pueblo Revival has a mission facade. Pueblo Revival ha has the terrorist elements, but is stri stripped down into this like really sort of more modern and elegant look. Okay. Is that a joke? Agreed. <laughs> Agreed, and then we have to throw in the territorial style. <laughs> Absolutely. So territorial is uh, anything after 1840, was it six, eight? Right. Um, and the way that you can tell territorial style building is because it's got milled wood, and usually it's painted white. Um, so anything that has actually cut wood, it's not hand carved, is uh, where we start to get into territorial. And then also we got brick kilns at that point. So they started putting the bricks on the top of the parapets because then they wouldn't have to remud the parapets every, uh, as often. Okay, we'll leave that for another lecture. <laughs> right. well, and, and, prior, and prior to the Gross Kelly building that, that Rapp did um, on the campus of the university is Hodgen Hodg Hodg Hall and I can, we, we have Hodgen Hall, which was remodeled from a Richardson Romanesque into the, into the quote, the Pueblo style by E.B. Christie and, and Dr. Tite, the president, um, in 1908. And prior to that, uh, 1906, there was the heating plant um, and, and Tite's house that, um, that Christie did. So it actually it predates Santa Fe. I think you're right. I was going to say Meyer Ella Jenkins. You probably have run into that name mm -hmm. um, when I got Hodgen Hall on the uh, state registry, and then it was nominated for the national. Uh, it was done as the uh, uh, the rebirth of the Pueblo style uh, in the Southwest, and she disagreed, saying it was the re remodeling of the Palace of the Governors from territorial back to Pueblo style that actually did it. And of course, Hodgen predated that by a couple of years, so. Myra Ella never talked to me again. Oh, no. Scandalous, Joe. Scandalous. I have a quick question for either Rachel or Joel. Um, I've read, I can't remember where, I think I've seen it a couple of times. This is about the Coronado Museum. It's just a detailed question. I've always been curious. They, I've read where they said that it was built out of Tarones. Um, and uh, I've always wondered if they really meant Tarones or if they were talking Adobe bricks. I know, I know actually for sure that the Church Street Cafe in Albuquerque was built out of Tarones, um, you know, but, but I don't know in the 1940s what, or, th or late 30s that anybody was using that anymore because um, it's a very difficult process and, and the river has to provide just the right type of sort of environment for, for the Tarone thing to even happen. So right. is it just built out of reg well, regular or adobe bricks like we think of them today? D did you know? I've always been curious. I haven't seen the wall open and it's not on the drawings. Oh, so okay. I, I would, oh, Joe ahead. may know. 
Um, I, I have seen I have seen the wall open. Um, there was some damage. Um, the stone that did not go in along the base, um, there was a, um, a, a restockoing that had to be done. And, and to, to my knowledge, um, and I live in an Adobe house, um, uh, interesting thing is that it, um, it's one of Leon Watson's. Um, it was his model home. And actually we had 18 inches of dirt on our roof, not eight. <laughs> so, and it was built in 1939, about the same time period. But um, no, the amount of, of Tyrone's, I mean, just the area that you would have to do, you know, yeah. a building that size. But what I saw was, was just standard Adobe. I do. Thank you very much. I've always wondered. Uh, Rachel, uh, question the city library on Central across from the Artichoke Cafe. By any chance, was that designed by John Gaumeen? Artichoke Cafe. City. Oh, yes, I believe it was the Special Collections Library. Right. I think that's right. I think you're right about that. Yeah, no, it's good. I think it's a UNM building. No, no, not no. UNM. No, we, oh. only, we only had 17 of Meme's buildings or his firm's buildings on the campus. Okay. <laughs> it is oh. a stunning building. Oh, mm -hmm. and Rachel, if, if, yes, you run it, if you run into the list, and on the North Campus Golf Course, we need to talk, but on the North Campus Golf Course is, um, is the, the shelter. And it's a poor tall and so on and so forth. It is not a John Galmeen building. It, it was copied from work on, on the university campus, but it was done by the physical plant. And it's been mislabeled a meme building, I don't know how many times, so. Oh, interesting. I would love to walk the campus with you someday. Sure. <laughs> well, I've, I've had my shots. <laughs> I've, I'm, I'm 10 days out. I'm almost there. I've got the second one. I just have to wait 14 days, you know? We'll have to do it while we both can still see. Yeah, right? <laughs> I would love that. I'd be happy to do it. Barb, thank you so much for letting me attend. Oh, no, no sweat, Joe. You're my BFF now. <laughs> <laughs>